How about that? Hey, everybody. Welcome to Live from the Ranch. Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where in the world you're joining us from. And I want to welcome my co-host, Juliana DeWillems. She is with uh, JW Dog Training and Behavior in the Washington, D.C. area. Hi, Juliana. How are you doing today? Hey, Ken. I'm great. It feels like, you know, we've gotten a lot of each other in the last week, thanks to Clicker Expo Live, but makes me all the more excited to be meeting again. That's right. In fact, for those of you joining us either on YouTube Live or on Facebook Live, this is a new platform for us. We've been doing uh, Live from the Ranch since 2020, but just this year we switched to YouTube Live and to Facebook Live. So we're so glad that you could join us. And we, all of us that are on this episode today, just finished Clicker Expo Live, which was a virtual event. And uh, we had a great time. Juliana presented and my two guests presented as well. And so today, we're going to jump right into it. We have a lot to talk about. In fact, one of the things we're going to talk about, Juliana, is we're going to talk about real world working dogs and the challenges we face in desensitizing them and preparing them for the real world. So my two guests today have been on Live from the Ranch before, but we've not talked about this topic. I'm not going to go into in-depth uh, profiles of the two of them because you can look at them on our website. But my guests today are Melissa Millette with Ultimates. Uh, she and her team are from Canada. They do lots of live shows and uh, she also does a lot of work in the film industry. And then my second guest is Michelle Pouliot who also uh, has uh, worked extensively uh, with Guide Dogs uh, for the Blind where she's really helped implement positive reinforcement training for them. She is a freestyle competitor Editor, a internationally uh, recognized freestyle competitor. And what's interesting about my two guests is both of them are amazing trick trainers. They do wonderful things with tricks. And that's not even what we're going to talk about today um, because they are so skilled and so uh, versatile in so many other areas. So I want to welcome both of you here. First of all, Melissa, I understand that you are actually coming to us from Italy. Is that true? Yes, uh, we're working on a show out here with my cat, who's still not tired, and my dog right there, who is already tapped out. <laughs> well, we're glad you could join us. I know it's like 10 o'clock at night, your time, but we understand that you're going to demonstrate some stuff with your team back in Canada, and we'll be seeing them in just a few minutes. And of course, Michelle, you're coming to us from Oregon, from the west coast of the U.S., and uh, I'm so glad you could join us, and I see lots of your ribbons behind you. Uh, you've done, you've You've uh, run, run championships in more than just freestyle. Before you were a freestyle trainer, you did obedience and other types of competitions as well. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. It's kind of an opposite world. Working guide dogs for the blind is my career. And then in my hobby, training for competition sports. One is quite serious and the other is like just fun. Well, that's good. Well, we're glad to have both of you here. I'm going to have both of my guests stay with us for the entire hour. Even though we may be talking about other topics, I think their input, their questions, their insight would be really, really beneficial. But we're going to talk with Melissa first because you've been working in the film and TV world for quite a while now. And uh, that is a... That is the kind of work where there are a lot of preparations that need to be made. No matter how well you prepare in your training facility, it seems that once you get on set, there's a lot that your dogs and cats are going to have to prepare for. Tell us a little bit about that transition from working in a studio or not working in your home or in your training facility and that transition to going to a set. Definitely a lot of changes. Like for example, we get the script, we see what the dog, the behaviors the dog is going to perform, and I have to train it on myself, then to perform with another individual as a prop, not on, not on myself, with me 15 feet away, and then when we show up, they do a blocking, and they change it again, <laughs> and you have to train on the fly. So certainly, it's a it's a surreal world. Yeah, I've always said that training for the film world, even if you really can prepare for a lot of the distractions, it's hard to prepare for what the director is going to suggest and what kinds of changes he or she is going to make at the location. Yeah, they, they don't know until they see it. They, once they do the blocking and they see it, then they, they change. I mean, it stays similar to it, but they don't even understand how different it is for a dog. 
Hey, I tell you what, let's, let's do this. I know I, I understand from the chat window that my microphone is really hot, which means it's loud, and I have the ability to maybe control that, but I'm going to have to leave my seat. But you know what we could do? Can we look at a scene from uh, an episode that you did of Titans not too long ago? Because I think you're going to demonstrate for us the training that you did for that. So why don't we go to one, a scene like that while I, adjust my, uh, um, while I adjust my microphone? Sound good? All right. How's my sound now? I hopefully am a little softer, but you can still hear me? Or can you hear me? All right, good. So that was like a pretty straightforward scene, but there was a lot going on there. The dog was in between all of the superheroes, and at some particular point he had to look back at Superboy and then look back at the, uh, at the, uh, at the camera. Tell us what the challenges were for that, for that, uh, for that particular scene. Yeah, for when we when we get that uh, that's holy energy sashimi. Uh, when we get that script and we're looking at it, the first thing is I'm, I'm looking for red flags. So the first thing you'll notice if you are an animal person is the screaming that Gizmo was doing. And how could we acclimate a cat a dog to that when the person is acting very intense? So you'll notice that we actually we actually separated that. There's no wide with the dog and Gizmo because we said the dog's not going to handle that. So that's the first thing, but we still prepped for it. But then we email the director and say, just so you know, I think that's too much for the dog. So I don't want to shoot a wide and scare the dog. Um, second, when we're looking at the elements, it's the dog is looking forward, barks, looks back at the handler, and then looks forward again which can be very confusing with all the looking this way and that way. But the thing is that when we shot the wide, the, the actor can't say, watch. We saw his mouth. So we had to train the dog to look back at the actor, super convincing and fast, without the actor saying anything. My first challenge was actually that I had thought I would be really smart, and I thought, I'm going to teach this dog to look at the actor to the word crypto. Because that's usually when you say the dog's name, the dog in previously was looking at him. And you'll notice in the scene, he goes, crypto speak. And the dog was not supposed to look at him. So that was my first challenge. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, so we, as a team, we trained Pepsi to, the, here's our big secret. Uh, it's a Hollywood secret, buzzers. Um, where we, we had a necklace with a buzzer in it, and it would buzz, and he would look when he heard the buzz so that the actor didn't have to speak. That's excellent. Well, I understand your team is back in Canada. I think we have Melissa and Melanie standing by. Tell us a little bit about, hey, Melissa. Hi, Melanie. How are you? So what are we going to demonstrate? Uh, Melissa, tell us a little bit about what they're going to be doing and, and, and how, that prepared, how you prepared for that scene. Okay. Yeah, so we have Mel, Melissa, Melanie, and Melanie, or Melissa, Melissa, and Melanie, three Mel's. Um, what really important team because sometimes I go away like I am right now, and these girl ladies have to step in and handle the dog. So there's even deeper elements where I have to train to listen to me to the actor and then through another trainer to the actor. Um, in this scene, um, we're going to recreate. There's a trainer and there's an acclimation actor, which is usually also a trainer, so that the trainer can use the other individual as a prop. So, if Melanie and Melissa, if you want to grab the buzzers and you can show us the buzzers first. Now, Zoom was uh, blanking out the buzzers. Let's do first to see if we can hear the buzzers. Melissa's holding the necklace that the uh, department made for us. Can you hear it? Yeah. Yeah, we're ahead of Zoom. Finally. Okay. So do you, uh, so basically, do you want us to go into the training session, Ken, now, or do you want me to give more of an explanation of what we're going to see? Um, yeah, whatever you think is best. I'm going to leave this to you. You know your team and what you're going to show, so you just take control of this, and we're just going to enjoy and watch. Okay, fantastic. Um, so Melanie is going to be, this is an interesting part because we're talking about desensitization and generalization. Um, often when we train, I'm the key trainer, and Melissa is the acclimation actor. 
And when we did a prep session where Melissa was the handler and somebody else was the actor, he was like, no, no, I look at Melissa. Because it's, it's actually often the same people for Pepsi as the same actors and the same handlers, um, except when I'm done. So in this case, we're going to, Melanie's going to be the acclimation actor and let's bring Pepsi out and let's, let's start a Pepsi on a mark with no handler. Now, just as a fun fact, Ken, uh, Juliana, I feel should, uh, I should leave my chihuahua to her and my will. But I always thought if I was going to leave a dog to you, Ken, it would be Pepsi. I feel like he's a dog to you. He's an all-around good boy. Uh, we've encouraged him being a silly Billy because he was very shy. <laughs> so we've encouraged some of that naughtiness. Okay. All right, Melissa, if you want to reinforce him for being a mark, start. There we are. Good. Yeah, just on his mark. Now... I'm going to put Melanie on Pepsi's right-hand side. So let's give a reset treat, Mel, and we'll get Pepsi in there. Now, Pepsi's character is Crypto the Superdog, which is uh, Superman's dog, like the DC League of Super Pets. Now, Melanie is holding her hands like a superhero. It's very important, okay? Um, we have the dog... When when the actor holds the treat, we always have them hold it, and they can hold. So we can cheat. You know, it'd be great to do it without treats, but if I can cheat, why not? So the actor always holds it in the hand away from the dog because mugging is really unprofessional and obvious. So I'm gonna have Melanie begin by cueing the dog um, by using his name, Pepsi. Then she's gonna mark and feed same side. Uh, same hand. Okay, so Melanie, if you want to do three of those. Yes, very nice. Pepsi. Yes. Pepsi. Yes. Good. Now it's just a, a fun cue transfer where uh, Melissa's going to buzz at the same time that Melanie cues, but M Melissa's buzz is going to cue Melanie to say Pepsi. Ready? Same. same. He's doing it already. <laughs> Pepsi. Yes. Good. I think Pepsi understands the cue. Did you have something, Ken? I was just going to ask, how much time do you have to practice this with the actual actors? Uh, the actor that we had on this series comes to us and says, I'll do as much work as you need. And he was so good. We were like, can you please join our team as an animal trainer? And honestly, many times he would catch things that I would miss. And I'd be like, really? Okay, just join our team then. Um, we were with the same character for four, three seasons. And so we didn't need as much because he was really savvy. But generally, we would get five minutes in a dance or half an hour if we requested it. Not a lot, though. That's excellent. Yeah. Okay, so Melissa, if you want to do two more, if you want to do just buzzing, just the buzz... And Melanie's going to mark and feed. Break. Okay, good. And very important piece that I missed. Do you see how Melissa turned around, Ken? I forgot about that. That's the, also the cue to the dog not to look at me. So if we want an organic eye line, or if we want a cue for him not to look, then we would turn. And so after we got that piece, we had to start thinking about how much do I pay the dog for looking at me? And how much do I pay the dog for looking at the actor? Because, you know, he starts to anticipate and he needed to be very specific. Eye line to the trainer over camera, eye line to the actor, eye, eye line to the trainer speak, 
And um, when it was all said and done, I sent crypto number two home to his owner. And she said, why is he drawing his ears back every time I take a photo or ask him to look? He, they started understanding that when I held a tree for him to look, it was the, they were going to hear a sound behind. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's basically, do you want to keep going and add in the bark or is this the... No, this is great. I, we can, why don't we do the bark as well and then we can talk. Okay, great. Uh, most of you have, okay, that's perfect. So, uh, one thing that we don't want is offered barking at us. And we found if we have a, um, the, a, a cue to let him know that it's time to bark, then we can put it more on stimulus control. So, Melissa's holding the cue. Do you want to show us what it is, Melissa? This is the bark ball. So, unless I'm holding the bark ball, I'm not asking you to bark. Please don't. <laughs> So Melissa, if you want to um, stand uh, camera left so that you can hold the camera, the ball over just the same as we did it, perfect. And we can start to incorporate the speak. So hold the ball over, you can hold it where we can see it, Mel. And then ask him for a speak. So we kind of pop the ball in front of him and then we'll, <laughs> he's like, I'm not getting that ball, I'm not getting off my mark. So I'm trying to remember, it was look, crypto speak, back at the action, and then look again. So let's, uh, let's go, um, let's do one more eye line to Melanie, Melanie pay, and then we'll add the speak, okay? Got your buzzer ready, Mel? Yeah. Great, very nice. Okay, and now we'll go uh, bark ball, eye line to actor. Break. Okay, we got it. Good. That looks great. <laughs> yeah, so it's a lot of eyeline work and a lot of patterning, and then we show up and they change it on us. It's, it's, it's really neat. Well, I, first of all, I want to say thank you to, to Mel and Mel. I appreciate you showing that off. That looked great. And you know what? Before we talk about it, would you mind if we watch the clip again? Because now that we've seen all the things that you just did, let's watch the actual clip and then we can talk. Crypto. Uh, crypto. That's great. Did, That's. Did, did you know that he had that ear drawn back towards the buzzer the entire time? <laughs> and so, that th th that was great. I'm curious as to what kind of of other challenges you face when you get there. Clearly, you had it well trained. Um, but are there other distractions and things that get that have thrown your dogs off in the past? Uh, or, or, or do you usually get them so well prepared that you don't usually have too many challenges? I'm going to say the biggest distraction that we faced was raccoons popping out of the ceiling. Um, <laughs> we we uh, this is really interesting, actually, because Pepsi was a a COVID dog. So we adopt, I adopted him from Missouri. He was abandoned in a snowbank. He had to have a very specific look, brought him up. He had heartworm. He was too small. He was nervous of people. And so uh, then they canceled COVID. I had six months to build his confidence. So he was only socialized to the world of Titans. It's dark, creepy. It's always a bomb going off, mafia people having meetings. And it's, so we've done, uh, abandoned power plants and we've done all sorts of creepy environments it's always creepy so the abandoned power plant raccoons were popping out of ceilings and creeping everywhere and it was we were like so most of the time we would show up in an environment and go really like really like how are we supposed to make a dog feel cool in this environment but that became normal for petsy so right. talking about generalization and descent and i took him to a commercial that was a white picket fence happy family and I thought, oh, this is going to be so easy for him. And he showed up and he goes, where are we? What is going on? He was used to dark, creepy, smoky. And I thought, that's really interesting. Yeah, that's it. That is interesting. You know, uh, we had an interesting uh, comment come up in the uh chat and, and this was from someone named jennifer who has previously or maybe still does represent the american humane association on set 
for uh, animal actors, and she, she commented that it concerns her that, that a lot of times uh, trainers will say that using positive reinforcement isn't practical, but I know that you and I both uh, have done a lot of film work and TV work, and we use only positive reinforcement. Uh, and how unusual have you found that to be in the film world, um, Melissa? I think it's really interesting because I find a lot of animals are not even trained. A lot of animals are wrangled and manipulated. Um, but I found that positive reinforcement is on the minority. Um, but we, I also have represented as, a, as an agent for the past five years. And because of the constantly changing sets, animals that are trained with correction, they don't know what's going to happen. So they don't know that they're right. So they're worried about getting a correction. And right. then all of that stress muddies their, their, their clarity. And the animals that I represent are positive reinforcement only. And if there's somebody that I uh, enjoy and I bring them and I find they're not as positive, I actually take over handling their dog because they can't be worried about making a mistake. Um, Pepsi is the ultimate in sensitive and the only way to bring out the best in him was positive reinforcement. I think all animals, because they just are, they're not afraid to make a mistake with the constant changes. Right. I think that's critical. First of all, I want to make a correction. Uh, Jennifer, who's watching on Facebook, said that she wasn't representing the AHA. It was another organization. But either way, uh, I think it's an important point because I do think, and Michelle, maybe you can comment on this as well. In a lot of the working dog world, uh, organizations often are really eager to use positive reinforcement, but they will often say, but when it comes to distractions, I have to use punishment. And uh, I have found that it isn't necessary, but it does a di require a different mindset. And I know that we'll probably talk about that a little bit later when we uh, talk about your area, but tell us a little bit about the challenges that was and what it was like to face that desire to have to use punishment or corrections to deal with distractions. Are you talking to me? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Me and Michelle. So yeah, I agree that, uh, I mean, I can't even imagine doing what Melissa does and using traditional techniques. I mean, I'm like, I, I know it happens. And I was on a couple movie sets during my traditional training days, but still I was using food for some reason instinctfully because I knew that to get my dog to look the way they wanted him to look, he needed to have something he wanted really bad. But yeah. that difference between even people who are changing over from, from a correction-based training to positive reinforcement training, I think that is one of the last thoughts to finally go is that it's so ingrained that for distractions though, I need to bring out punishment. Right. And I think the weak link in them learning how to effectively use positive reinforcement for distraction work is getting the history of reinforcement for the behavior you want without the difficult distractions. That's the piece that people miss because they never they never controlled the distraction level when they were gonna punish. Right. They just went out in the world and experienced the distractions and punished it. And right. to have positive reinforcement work around difficult distractions, they have to have that base, that reward history, so the, the animal can work up to wanting to ignore the distraction for the reward right. that's coming. Yeah, that's a good point. As a matter of fact, this is a topic that I'm going to be talking about at Clicker Expo in Washington, D.C. So let me just take a quick break and, and talk a little bit about that. And then we'll come back and I'll do some demos and we'll talk in general about, uh, about uh, this issue of positive reinforcement is a way to deal with distractions and it can be really effective. All three of us actually just finished participating in Clicker Expo Virtual Live along with Juliana, the four of us were there. And we are hoping that everybody watching will try to join us for an in-person Clicker Expo in Washington, D.C. on March 17th, 18th, and 19th. In fact, Melissa, Michelle, and I are gonna be doing a session together on uh, introducing and working with animals live there. And we hope that you'll join us and the rest of our faculty uh, as we explore teaching and training excellence. We're gonna examine and experience the principles, the practices and insights that Clicker Expo faculty members use to achieve high levels of success 
in their diverse fields consistently and how they can help you do the same thing with your trading. So go to Clicker Expo uh, website, go to clickertrading.com, look at Clicker Expo, and that's where you're going to be able to find out a lot about that event. In fact, one of the things I'm going to be talking about, and I've, I've adjusted my camera here just a little bit, is I'm going to be talking a little bit about the whole idea of how to prepare for distractions and how to do that in a uh, in a positive reinforcement way. I'm going to ask Marla to come up and join me. Hey, buddy, you want to come on up? Now, what I'm going to do first is just going to show you, and I know you may not be able to see my head. I just want you to be able to see him, is I am going to start by um, just making sure I have some clean behaviors and make sure So I'm going, to, I'm going to pull out. Oh, I left my clicker over here. I'm going to pull out my clicker just so that I can use that. And I'm just going to do some simple, easy behaviors first without any kind of distraction. So he sits. I'm going to ask for a paw. Good boy. I'm going to ask for a target. I'm going to ask for another paw. And one of the ways that I really work on distractions is once I have really solid behavior, I move to a new location. And I mean, I just simply call, come over here, buddy. I'm going to move to a situation where I'm now having him looking out the window. There's a huge window over there and he can see all of everything going on outside. And even though I'm moving to this other location, he should still work pretty well. And if he isn't going to be responding quickly and on time, then that tells me I'm moving too quickly. But normally he's doing really well. And then once that works really well, come on, buddy. I then try to think about how can I change the way the, uh, the cue looks. So I'm going to grab some additional treats because I'm using these on cue training treats, mainly because he thinks of them as really high value treats. He really likes these. And as soon as I start giving distractions that are big or really distracting, I find that it's helpful to use something that is of high value. So these have worked out really well for me. So one of the things that I do is to really make my cues different is I'll do something crazy like just get down on the ground and then I'll say, well, hi, buddy. And I'll see, will he still respond to cues? Can I still get him to touch a target? Good boy. Can I get him to lay down? Good. How about give me a paw? That's hard. Oh, there you go. He found a way to give me that paw. Good boy. And then, all right, buddy. Once I see that that's working, then my next session is probably going to be to move him to a totally new location. So what I'm going to try to do is move outside. So come on, buddies. I'm going to switch my camera here so you can see what I'm doing outdoors. And then I'm going to run outdoors and just show you some more work while I'm going to try to desensitize him and stuff. So I'm moving outdoors. Hopefully my microphone will still work. Hey, buddy. Now, we've got a big bunch of tables and stuff right here that are covered with a big cover because it's winter. And first it's just, okay, now I'm outside. I'm in the sun. There's birds. There's all sorts of things going on around me. I'm going to make sure I have his attention. And then I'm going to go through that same series of behaviors. Sit. How about a paw? Good. How about a target? Nice. Once I see that he's doing well there, then my next step is say, how else can I make this situation really different? So I'm going to try something I've never done before. I'm going to see if I can get up here on top of this, this bench back here, but get Marlon to move on the other side of all of this distractions, just to see that he's still able to do the same series of behaviors. So I'm going to get up here. Hey, buddy. No, why don't you come up? Why don't you come around over this way? Good boy. Here you go. One of the things I like about these treats is because they're not round, they bounce. If, I, if they hit the ground, if he doesn't catch it, it doesn't move away and he's able to get it. So now that he's watching me, can you sit? What's over there? See, he got distracted. It's okay. 
You want to sit for me? He's never seen a cue from this perspective with something in the middle, but he did really, really well. Hey, bud. I know, I see that bird too. Marlon. Good. Gave me eye contact, so I'm going to toss him a treat. Oh, he caught that one. You want to lay down for me? He's going to come around. Hi, bro. He's not really sure what I'm doing. Probably work with him to get him to move around. Come on, buddy. Let's go down here. Let's try this. And that's what I will do, though. A big part of... Let's get, let's get down here. Let's get down there. There you go. Is is work with the animal and say, okay, here's a distraction that he's never worked with before. Can you come over here? Hey, buddy. Okay, good. Can you sit? Nicely done. That's really good. Oops. Can you get it? All right, good boy. Can you come over here? Good boy. There you go. And so I'm a little bit. And that's how... That was a bad throw on my part. And that begin slowly exposing animals to new types of distract. I, I think what that just gives you a sense, and I haven't even really begun to show and demonstrate really novel distractions, but let's just for a minute before we all talk about it, let me switch the camera around and maybe what we can do is talk a little bit about the ranch. We are here at the ranch right now and uh, we are certainly hopeful that some of you will be able to join us at the ranch. And uh, we have early bird savings going on right now. And all that means is that if you have an opportunity to join us at the ranch, uh, we have uh, comprehensive multi-day courses and focused two-day seminars and workshops designed for professionals who care for and train dogs, exotic animals, marine mammals, and so much more. So. Register by February 9th, and you can get up to $200 off the 2023 classes. So I'm going to ask Juliana to rejoin us here and help me with this. Since I was doing sessions, I'm going to try to put things back into place and just uh, see what questions my panel has or some comments they have about desensitization and preparing animals for working in the real world. Okay, I'm going to catch my breath and allow you guys to talk for a second. So, 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 so good. I, I want to make sure that my mic sounds good if everybody can put in the chat, like if it's a good volume. And then also I want to remind everyone to use your YouTube or Facebook chat for any questions you might have. I know I have plenty of questions and maybe the others have questions as well, but we want to also get to your questions. So um, Melissa or Michelle, do you have any questions or what were your thoughts about that session? Which by the way, Ken was, very entertaining. Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't sure it was supposed to be entertaining, but I'm glad. <laughs> so uh, what is so similar to what I do is early in, in creating a new behavior, really early, as soon as I have a loop going at whatever level, I'm going to do exactly what Ken did. Even in the exact same room, I'm just going to turn around and face the other way or have the dog facing a different way, even though I'm still working at the same level of progression, but I'm not gonna wait until I have a behavior completely trained before trying it in a little different look. So for freestyle, some of the way I can change things is I'll put a hat on. So I still have my full body cue that I normally have, like if I was standing up asking them to kick a paw up, but I can put a hat on or I can put a coat or a wig or I can hold, just hold a prop and be asking for the same thing. So while I've got that great loop that we all want, the, you immediately after the swallow, get the next behavior offered, that's when I'll start doing that. Yeah, that is that is such a key part of it for me. Uh, I always, when I'm working with professional trainers who are saying, I don't know how to get distraction-free training or how to get my dogs to ignore distractions using positive reinforcement, a big part of that is making the environment novel every single time. Even if it's just minor, like you say, changing orientation, moving to another corner of the room. And then when I move outside, I of course move outside to locations that they already know, where the, where the distractors are things that they're used to. 
And when we got out there, he got a little distracted by a bird flying by, but that's okay. Um, I'm always changing and adding new things. Now, if I'm going to train a brand new trick or a brand new uh, behavior, then I might minimize the distractions at that first session, but I'll still usually be in some kind of a new location, wearing some kind of a hat, some kind of something, so that the animal just gets used to the fact, yeah, it's always different, and that's normal. And that's a big way of getting animals to the fact, I think the biggest mistake people make is they start throwing distractions at their animals that they can't control. And I like to begin with easy distractions that are minor, but the animal starts to say, yes, I still meet criteria no matter what's going on around me. And I only start moving to those higher intensity distractions after the animal's gotten really good and used to the fact that it's changing all the time. Um, so that's, 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 that's how, I, how I've always done it. I mean, Melissa, how does that vary or, or is it similar to some of the stuff that you've done for film work? I think a lot of film work is um, I can show them the distraction. I can show them exactly what's going to happen. So I'll go through the process and I'll say, uh, I'll say to the director, uh, well, we'll watch the blocking. And then I'll say, I just want to show him the camera application. Can you bring the boom over his head? And I can stay there with him very, very close. Um, can you come in the way you did, but at 20% now and then more? But then the general is sort of the distraction training happens. So that's when we actually get to set. So I don't know why people would want to use punishment for that. Of course they do. But the difficulty for me lies in generalizing my behavior to an actor. So you're going to do all these things that I taught you, but you're going to perform it for this person. And then we're going to shove the camera in your way, in your face 50,000 times. And it's a lot of the camera applications. So we, you know, yeah, try to, I have to stand on this side of the camera. I have to stand on this side of the camera. I you know, might be hiding behind something just like you just did, which is maybe why you, that was a great example. Yeah. Because a lot of times we can't be seen. And right. um, yeah, so, so a lot of that. And, and really interesting too, is that during Clicker Expo, my friend Courtney that works in film in Winnipeg and we're texting each other. We're like, wow, what Michelle does is really a lot like what we do working with guide dogs. And I actually followed Michelle's reverse front video for the work away. So yeah, really neat. Uh, but exactly what you were doing just now is exactly what you would need to do for a film set because of the hiding. And, and that's why I always work on stuff like that. I'm always just saying, like, that's why I lie on the ground to give a cue. That's why I go behind something to give a cue. Uh, in uh, Maggie Fainer, who's watching on YouTube, says, and I, I know Maggie, I used to work with her years ago. Uh, so hi, Maggie. She says, I love that that was uh, so real life. Marlon giving you data that behind the barrier was too crazy and too fast. Exactly. What you do is you change some things and then you go, oh, okay. Now I see this is... If I'm going to work behind this barrier, I'm going to do some additional work. And that tells me. But he wasn't nervous. He just didn't quite understand. And so I have the ability to keep working with him. But I constantly keep changing things so that, that the animal's just used to the fact it's always different. It's never the same. Well, I think we've got a good period of time to ask a bunch of questions. Let's, and I'd like to talk to Michelle a little bit about some of the things that she does with Guide Dogs for the Blind. So let me just quickly take a break and remind people that if you are interested in becoming a certified dog trainer through KPA, uh, we have lots of opportunities for you. Uh, there are 20 upcoming locations around the world, including the locations that, that are listed on your screen right there coming up really soon, like Columbus, Ohio, Raleigh, North Carolina, Montreal, Quebec, Magnolia, Texas, Nashville, Tennessee, and so many more. We just wanted to remind you that we are always offering courses for trainers that want to become professional trainers, and we want to, want to encourage you to visit the KarenPriorAcademy.com website. All right, let's get back to talking about desensitization. I gave a demo. We got to see a little bit of, of the great work that uh, Melissa has done. And, and, of course, Michelle, you're dealing with that kind of thing all the time. And um, uh, how difficult was, was it for Guide Dogs for the Blind? You know, I know that you led their transition to the use of positive reinforcement. Um, was the dealing with distractions one of the last pieces of the puzzle or where along the journey of transitioning to positive reinforcement did you start working on this desensitization and distraction issue well there's no doubt that it was easier for staff 
to learn how to train some of the skills with positive reinforcement versus punishment. But when it came to distractions, we weren't that good at it when we started because it is harder. You have to build up that reward history. So we weren't used to introducing distractions in increments as a traditional program. We were used to, we're out and about every day. So we're taking a fairly new guide dog after about a week of training on campus into a downtown area, even a quiet small town, but you can't control the environment. So we had a tradition, a history of just dealing with what came our way. And if you don't have that reward history, using positive reinforcement for a more difficult encounter isn't going to work. So although we might have started out right away using some positive reinforcement for distraction work, we, we had trouble tackling the difficult ones because we hadn't gotten that reinforcement history. So the, the most difficult common guide dog distraction is animals, uh, loose dogs, squirrels. That is usually the most difficult thing for us to tackle that a dog will make a choice to see a loose dog that's soliciting to be friendly and to ignore it and move on. And so that was the piece that was so new because we had to realize we have to stop and build a reinforcement history for the easy animal encounters, the ones that make it possible for them to be successful and see right. that that choice is, is a thing. Now, one thing I had never thought of and still I, until I started doing more freestyle work is in freestyle tricks, and Melissa knows this, it's a much more advanced behavior when we are not in the dog's view. So when we have a dog facing away from us to do a trick, it makes it so much harder. And we don't want them to look at us. Maybe we want the dog looking away as in reverse front that Melissa mentioned. And I haven't thought about, well, that's what a guide dog is doing. They're out ahead of the handler looking at the environment. So the handler is not physically present in their vision, constantly kind of reminding them that you're looking to me for advice and for cues. And I hadn't thought about it, but that's yeah. really true. Guide dog work in general is very difficult because they're looking away from the handler and what else do they see but things that are still. Yeah, you know, and um, one of the things that I didn't get to in demonstrating with Marlon is, for me, the big step is once you get an animal really used to minor distractions, it is moving to those harder distractions. But the mistake that I think people make is moving to them too quickly. And I think you start first with, you know, an assistant who dresses in a weird costume. You get remote control toys that you can control to come around in your pathway. All things that you can control and you can... Uh, uh, easily keep control on it, but you what you end up doing is you start building up that dog's expectation. Oh yeah, something weird's going to happen. Oh, that's unusual. But they get used to it. They get comfortable with it. It doesn't scare them. So that by the time you do get to the real deer running across the path in the forest, the squirrel that comes across the path, the dog that darts across the the, the field, you have built up to that, and you've built up to it with first with con with those distractions that you can control. Um, Juliana, I. There's so many things happening in the chat window, I haven't been able to pay attention. I wanted to make sure that you felt comfortable jumping in if there's a question that you thought you might want to bring to the, bring to the table here. We've got some general questions, um, none specifically about Michelle was, what Michelle was just talking about. So if you want to move on with covering her work, we can get to questions later or I can get to some questions right now. Well, let's get Melissa's uh, response and reaction to that discussion and then we'll take a question. Melissa. Uh, just something silly. Do, do you know what a creature performer is? There was a. I, <laughs> I'm familiar with the term, but but t tell us tell us. Uh, we had a CGI because uh, uh, Gar plays Beast Boy, so he morphs into other characters. So we right. had a scene where they were all walking downtown, and uh, on the end of the line was a CGI creature performer, which is a person dressed in head to toe black or green screen, crawling like a tiger in a dark alley. It was uh, it was a challenge. But anyway, funny that you had said that we had everybody we know dress up as superheroes in weird costumes. So 
so he was prepared for that. And we have a creature performer costume now. And whenever we always fight over who has to be the creature performer, crawling around all weird. But yes, because of the costumes, uh, we had been prepared. So. Yeah, one of the things that's really helpful is not only using costumes, but also getting used to different types of walks, walking with a limp, walking on all fours, or walking sideways, walking erratically. All of those things are things that freak dogs out at first unless you prepare them for it. And so I think that's a big part of desensitization is really thinking through the kinds of things your dog is gonna experience and approximating it gradually, slowly, so that those weird things are no longer weird. It's like, oh, there's that weird looking, weird moving thing again. Um, but you just keep changing its look. You keep changing the way it moves so that eventually the dog notices. But in a lot of ways, you're reinforcing them for checking back in with you or continuing on with their task without responding. Yeah, Michelle. So people are forgetting about positive reinforcement training is that because you're, you're rewarding dogs for not getting distracted, they see something that is distracting or even of concern, maybe. And the thing is, is you're turning those into cues. So right. if you keep in mind that what you're doing is making that weird looking actor a cue to continue working because you get reinforced for that, they actually start getting excited about seeing a distraction in an opposite excitement. Instead yeah. of the excitement being towards the distraction, the excitement is toward the handler. And right. that is a really cool thing. When you've environment that usually is a problem, you can do a good thing that helps the dog focus on their task because of the history of reinforcement for doing so. Right. And one of the things that I think is so important about what you just said, Michelle, is that it turns what might have been a scary experience or uh, an attracting experience into one that's like, oh, I just get more reinforcement when this occurs. And so what happens is the animal's like more focused on the task. It's like, oh my goodness, this means good stuff is coming. And they're not so interested in chasing it or running away from it or barking at it. They have become much more, this is a part of the environment. And boy, does this provide great reinforcement. Bring on the weird stuff. So we have a... Oh, sorry, Melissa, go yes. ahead. No, just one more thing that uh, that we do in film, because there's a lot of things that happen on, on, a, on a movie set that are very bizarre that you might not encounter. Um, I actually, I'm always in the dog's eye line as the trainer, and I actually hide trainers beside the dog so that he's not in it alone. So something weird, I mean, they've, they've been encountering... We started off with a dog that was afraid of any everybody, and we ended up with a dog watching his actor choke a guy out. And he was like, oh, you know, this is uh, normal. <laughs> but we hide a trainer beside him, and he goes, that, you know, that's maybe a little more intense than we practice. And he looks over, and she's there, and she's going, it's all right, buddy. And he's, okay. <laughs> you know, so we, we hide. Um, I do that in the real world as well. I bring really confident dogs. I even do that on set. So sometimes when you see some behind the scenes, you'll see the actors actually post photos of my dog with my red healer. Because my red healer's deaf, he's not, he doesn't get environmentally sensitive. So if something weird's happening, we bring in the red healer and then they play and they get silly and Pepsi looks at his brother and he's like, this is amazing. And Pepsi's like, this is amazing. Okay, this is amazing. So we do that. With That's great. No, I love that. Uh, let's make sure we get a couple of, uh, of our viewer questions, Juliana. So Speaking of your guide dog discussion you were just having, Clemmy is asking, is it poss is it especially hard for guide dogs because the same things could be distractions that they need to ignore or they need to tell their person about it depending on particular circumstances? Uh, not necessarily more difficult. Uh, it's a really good example of how well they can generalize. <laughs> because, for instance, uh, if, if, if we have a distraction and they have been trained to like, they see a loose dog ahead and they have a nice reward history on choosing to pass that dog. But also between between them, the handler team and that dog is a drop off. It's a curb, let's say a big old fashioned curb into a street. The dog has been so reinforced for doing stopping and showing that target the blind person and waiting for a cue to go down that tight 
change, that it's going to take priority over the second one, which the dog may be thinking about already. Like, huh, look at that cute little poodle. <laughs> but at the same time, I'm stopping at this little cliff and I will wait until my blind handler says forward. And then we're engaging into choosing to pass the distraction instead of choosing to stop at the curb. So no, I, I would say no. I would say that the reinforcement history kind of ends up acting on both of those things. One was something that wasn't ever distracting. In fact, it wasn't even notable in their environment. Before they learned how to stop at a drop off, they would have run right across it to go get the dog. But both of those things with a reward history, you're, you're getting the end result which is really fascinating when you think about it. There's no difference in the technique, really. We're, we're getting the behavior we want and we're reinforcing it. One of them is the behavior we want is against what their instinct is. And the other one is the behavior we want is something they would have never thought of doing. Why would I stop to, to step off a six inch height? Yeah, that's, that's such a key aspect to so much success. And in all of the working dog world, everywhere I go, they're always, that's their big thing. They're really interested in moving to, to positive reinforcement, but they just can't figure out how to deal with the distractions. And what they don't realize is that when you build up that reinforcement history, suddenly it takes care of so many things um, and, and, and really preparing them to expect the unexpected, but to continue doing their work. And doing their work is where they feel safe. Doing their job is with what they know is reinforcing. And all this other stuff, they kind of learn, oh, my trainer's got that under control. Uh, they're going to keep me safe. They've got the better reinforcers. And 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 so they're, the mindset is really different. And it's a lot of that fear, that desire to chase, that desire to engage goes away because of all that prior reinforcement history that you've put so much time into. Juliana, you got another? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. I am just gonna say is that I think one of the things really hard for working dog trainers that are changing over to positive reinforcement and the distraction thing just seems to still be difficult for them. It's because everything else they train, they're not dealing with, with something the dog would rather do. Right? right. So if I'm teaching all their basic skills and they learn them so fast with clicker training, so they're all excited about that because it all goes so fast. Distraction training, if a dog has a high distraction thing, incident or a, a specific thing, that's going to take longer because right. they already have something when they see that in the environment they really want to do. And now you're changing behavior. Changing behavior is a longer process regardless. So I think that's one reason they go, but the distractions, it doesn't work. Well, it does, but you're dealing with a problem that you have to actually right. change what they instinctively want to do. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Instead of just building a new behavior, you're changing an old behavior. So you're needing to move that. It's just a longer distance, but it's still very, very doable. Juliana, do we have another question out there that, that maybe we can answer? So I have a quick question, kind of speaking to what Michelle just said, a lot of people are quick to blame the dog or blame the, um, the training method, positive reinforcement for when behavior breaks down. What are some signs that a distraction is too hard or too much for a dog and that we've moved too quickly? What should we look for to know? Perhaps the obvious is the dog doesn't do the behavior, but <laughs> what else would you look for? Uh, yeah, I'd be looking for uh, I'm not getting anywhere with the reinforcement, meaning let's say I click them before they, they move towards an animal, okay? So there's a loose cat and maybe it's a setup. You, you set it up and someone just set a cat on the ground uh, 20 yards away and the dog looks at it and you click before they go and you're getting your reward in and you click before they go and you're getting a reward in, but the dog is still wanting to go. It's way too much. Yeah. Your reinforcement should be giving you some success really quickly. Yeah. So that means either the distraction is too difficult, which could mean just too close. It could mean right. let's move it 25 more yards away and do I get a reaction? But I also in my gut would be saying I need a higher value reinforcement. Right. It doesn't mean at the end when I finish all this, let's say the dog is extremely cat distracted. At the end, it doesn't mean I have to bring out liverwurst. What it does mean is to get the initial choice training that the dog sees the cue, <gasps> cat, ooh, no, high value treat. I'd rather pay attention to my handler. 
so to get that, sometimes you have to go to extremely high value to initially get a dog learning that choice is a good thing. If we're using the same level of value that we use for their regular training, we may find that that distraction habit, they practiced it so much and it is so rewarding that we're not gonna get anywhere. So my, what I'm looking for is not getting the response really quickly of seeing it and choosing not to go towards it. They might not be checking in with me yet, but they're not moving towards it. And really quickly, you should see them naturally checking in when they see that cue. Not that we have to have that as a criteria, but it's a good baseline for you to go, ah, I'm developing an environmental cue. He saw the cat and he looked back at me like, hey, did you see, I didn't go. Could you give me that treat? <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, and I would add to that, one of the mistakes that I think a lot of people make is that if they are able to click and reinforce the dog, but the dog is still looking at the cat, but because the dog successfully stayed with them, they often think to themselves, oh, I'll keep pushing that. And instead of saying, oh, wait, the dog didn't look at me, didn't engage with me, still wants to go after the cat, I need to change something. And so that's when we say, let's move the cat further away or let's change the value of the reinforcers, which is what Michelle suggested. But so often the trainer is in such a hurry to get to that end result, they think they've been successful because they see the dog is still there as opposed to, yeah, but he isn't responding the way you wanted him to. So that means you need to adjust a little bit. And when you adjust, you will get those results quickly, like Michelle suggested. It's just, we are so eager to go, oh, that's good enough. Let me go a little further. And then it breaks down and then you've lost it. You need to stay uh, under threshold and you need to get to that point where the animal's truly responding to what you're asking for. And if you're not, it's too difficult for them. And the other thing I just want to add is that people don't understand how difficult it is for a dog to move past to ignore a distraction versus just be still. And they don't get enough reward history on a difficult distraction with the dog stationary at first. And build the difficulty with the dog stationary before you can expect them to be able to walk, trot, run past it. Because that's hard. That's yeah. really hard for them. But for them to learn just to stand still and not go towards it can be a great way to build a reward history so that they start realizing that, that when I don't go towards that, da, 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 and you're way ahead of the game to get that reward history before you say, now I'm going to try to walk past that. Yeah. Melissa, did you have a comment about that? You look like you were about to say something. Yeah, no, I see there are a lot of film people that are joining us here. And what I would say is we actually carry a cooler with various levels of reinforcer, just like you're talking about. Because right. in the in the real life, we would move away and, re and and work at a distance. And in film, this is this is the shot. So before my dog, when I start to see, oh, this is going to be a problem, I have actually somebody standing by, Melissa or Melanie, with a cooler. And I say, mm, this looks like chicken. Or, oh, I think this one's steak. <laughs> and uh, we just utilize the, the correct reinforcer and if that if i feel like i need to i would also have the actors recreate slowly and build up and pay but yeah. uh so anyway when we can't change the environment in film we change the pay for sure just like you said yeah. and and melissa do you ever find do you ever find yourself with ju is it just food or do you also have things like certain types of chew toys and tug toys and other kinds of toys available as well as other options uh yeah i actually um I actually go to the store depending upon the animal but when i have a new animal i have a whole cooler of various foods and right. i have a dollar store bag or we'll go to the to the pet store and we'll be like okay you know and we'll pull out a brand new toy in between takes right. so that there's constantly new and then when i have an old pro i use their same old food in one toy and they'll work forever on that same food because they're they're there but it's yep. usually with the newer guys that we have to really pull out all the stops and it doesn't have to be forever Michelle, you had a thought about that? Yeah, I was just going to mention that a lot of people listening, it's a really good reason what we're talking about in, in choosing different values, not use the dog's ultimate high value for basic things that they're doing really well. And you can actually use a lower, more normal value food and, yeah. and it's working. As long as it's working well, it's fine. But I run into a lot of people with trick training, but they're always using this really high value food. And I go, what are you going to go to when you have a problem? 
right? It's like now the environment is becoming more interesting than what you're using because I get it all the time. So right. the, the novelty to the dog of getting something different and potentially something more valuable really help with distraction training is that yeah. maybe for that Labrador, he's getting kibble for every single thing he's learning in guide dog work. But when it comes to distraction, he's getting chicken. Right. right? That's, that's gonna, exactly. He's going to match that in his head as the environmental cue, because if you're consistent, he's going to go, ooh, the potential for chicken is high. And then as that is becoming the norm of his behavior, you can start easing back to a more normal, convenient food to use, which Melissa doesn't have to worry about that. She can use whatever value she wants the whole time. Whereas with a lot of working dogs, we always have this goal of getting back to something easy for a client to carry. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and even, even with the work that I do with some of the working dogs where they don't want to use food, we still use food as we teach them about distractions. And then we go back to finally getting to the chew toy or the tug toy or the other reinforcer that is very valuable, but we keep, we, we keep normalizing the behavior and then having that high value uh, treat available for later on. You know, this is, this is clearly, I, I got the right group of us together to talk about this. We have reached past the hour long mark. And so I'm gonna have to cut this discussion short. Tell for your friends, if you like this episode, uh, we are, the, the video is available on YouTube. The minute this uh, episode is over, you can look, look at it again, send it to your friends, or come back and see us next month. We have a great episode coming up in uh, March. Uh, March 2nd, my guest will be Emma Parsons. She is the author of Click to Calm, and during the month of February, she's launching a brand new course called Click to Calm for Instructors, and we're going to be talking about reactivity, dealing with reactivity, how to work with the Click to Calm procedures so that you can deal with your reactive dog. So join us on March 2nd. It should be a lot of fun. We also want to remind you that if you're enjoying the episode, but you have some suggestions of things that you would like to uh, suggest for, for future episodes, you can visit the ranch website, click on watch live, and there's a form there where you can share your comments, your suggestions, or your training videos. Every once in a while, we'll show training tutorials or we'll do a, a training challenge, and we get all of that from uh, YouTube. Uh, I'm sorry, not from YouTube, from Facebook or Instagram, if you use the hashtag uh, KPCT training challenge, but just go to the suggestions spot. Tell us about people you'd like to see on the, up, on the, on the, uh, on the broadcast. I'd love to have them as guests. And finally, uh, just a reminder of all the different special uh, offers that we had for you today, whether it be about becoming a certified dog trainer or whether it be coming out here to the ranch or coming to clicker expo we hope to take advantage of some of these offers i want to thank melissa and her two uh, uh guests mel and mel who also helped with the uh uh the work with the dogs um and i want to thank michelle and of course juliana thank you so much for for hosting with us every episode this is our 63rd i'm sorry jump hit my computer there. It's our 63rd episode. We love having all of our guests come. We appreciate all the questions. Sorry we couldn't get to all of them this time, but we hope to see you next month here on Live from the Ranch. Happy training, everybody. Bye-bye.